So my nemesis just stole another client. I got a feeling. I got a feeling. Oh, hello. There's the two of you in a photo together. Looks like you're on a night out. So you're not talented. You just know more people. You know what? No. It's all good. It's all good. I'm a patient man. <laughs> Don't write a Facebook post about it. Don't write a Facebook post about it. That's great. So, in this video, I'm going to show you how to do... So, the main reason why I wanted to do this video, other than me having loads of time on my hands, because 2020 is just an absolute danger is this photo right here. Now, I took this five years ago when I first started doing photography, and there's a lot of potential in this photo. I mean, look at the rays coming down from the clouds. It looks pretty dramatic. And the problem is, I did not know how to use my camera at the time. So I just left all my settings in auto, and I took it in JPEG. Now, for those that don't know, JPEG is kind of the end product file. It's very limited in what detail you can get from it and what you can do in the edit. Whereas the raw file, which is what I should have been using, uh, retains a lot more detail and you can do a lot more when you edit with it. So I could have brightened up the darker areas of the photo and got more detail out of it. Whereas if I just did that in JPEG, I would have got a lot of noise. So that pretty much sums up the difference between raw versus JPEG and I didn't need a full video to do it. So what I wanted to do was retake uh, the same shots, or at least very similar, in the same place, same time, with all the skills that I'd acquired over the past five years. And I also thought this would be a good opportunity to show you how to do a long exposure. But what is a long exposure? To sum up, a long exposure is when you open the shutter for an extended period of time and you're letting more ambient light. It's good for capturing the passage of time in a single photo and you can get lots of cool effects, like you can get clouds stretching off into the distance. Or if you were to take it at night, you could get lots of lovely vibrant colors due to the extra ambient light that you're allowing into the sensor. So I'm going to show you how to do that, but first, if you are going to attempt a long exposure, there are a few things that I would strongly recommend. Firstly, a tripod is near essential. Now, if you don't have a tripod, you can always place it on a flat, solid surface, like for this shot, I placed it on a just a regular flat wall. This does greatly restrict your options though, and there's no guarantee you can find such a surface at the location, so I would really recommend a tripod. The second is a wide lens, especially if you're shooting a landscape shot. I'm using a Tamron 24-70 G2 and I'll be shooting at the widest focal length of 24mm. But I would recommend you use an even wider lens if possible, 20mm, 16mm, even 14mm. The wider the lens, the more dramatic the shot. Just watch out for distortion. The third is an ND filter, or a neutral density filter. So the short and sweet version of what an ND filter is, it is a circular filter that you can screw onto the end of your camera and you can get them in various exposures ranging from kind of dark to super dark. Now I really wish I had one of these on my shoot and you will see why later in the video. Now if you don't have an ND filter then you'll just have to wait for a low light situation like I did. Now this was my first time doing a long exposure that wasn't at night, but I really wanted to get that cloud stretching off into the distance kind of effect. So to get the shot I travelled to the same place that I did last time, the Tandal Hills Monument. So I made it to the monument while avoiding all other people and set up my tripod. Now I have to film all these bits on my phone because obviously I need my camera to get the shot. Now my tripod is a Manfrotto, Mon Manfrotto, Manfrotto, am I saying that right? It's quite sturdy and solid, but it is quite expensive. You can get cheaper tripods, but they will likely not be as solid and be lighter, which will be problematic if it's windy, like it was for me, especially if you're shooting with a smaller camera. Now, there are some tripods that come with a hook at the bottom, which you can hang additional weight from, such as a backpack, and this will add support and reduce any camera shake caused by the wind. Speaking of the wind, make sure your bags are secure so they don't blow away. Ideally more secure than... Um, yeah, so set up your camera on the tripod or whatever surface you might be using. I wanted to use this sundial map thingy as the focal point of the image. Now to set up your camera in long exposure mode, you need to set your camera's shutter speed. My Nikon D780's slowest shutter speed is 30 seconds, but I wanted to expose the sensor for longer. 
to get that really stretched out look for the clouds. So I selected bulb mode using the shutter dial. In this mode you can press the shutter button to take the picture and the camera will continue to collect visual information as long as you have the shutter pressed. You want to set your ISO as low as possible for the best results in editing and you want to really stop the aperture down. The more you stop down your aperture the more will be in focus. However, be wary of going past f16. Beyond that, you'll start to see a softer image due to things like ghosting and diffraction. So these were my settings for this shot. I set my ISO to 100, uh, my aperture to f16, and I opened the shutter for a 70 second exposure. If your camera comes with stabilization, you'll want to turn that off because if the camera is on the surface, the stabilization motor can actually cause slight motion blur. I'd also recommend using a remote shutter to take the photo as the simple act of pressing the shutter button can cause vibration. I use the Nikon Snapbridge app to connect my phone through Bluetooth. However, if that isn't an option for you, you can simply set the camera to a self timer mode. Immediately into shooting, there was a problem. I arrived at sunset, so it was darker, but it was still way too bright. Remember, the longer you hold the shutter down, the more light you let into the sensor. The files from the D780 are very flexible in the editing, but I didn't want to risk blowing out the highlights so much that I couldn't save them in editing. So I waited for it to get darker, and I managed to get some pretty good shots of the sunset while I waited. Did I mention it was f***ing cold? One hour later, I finally got a shot that I was happy with. So, here's the shot that I got five years ago, and here's the shot I took yesterday. I know, it's still pretty dark, but remember, this time I shot it in RAW, so I can raise the shadows in editing. As a rule of thumb, it's easier to brighten shadows than it is to darken highlight, so it's always better to underexpose than it is to overexpose. So, after a bit of fiddling around with it, here is the result. I am pretty buzzing over this photo. You can probably tell that the clouds are moving parallel to the camera, which wasn't the look I was after. I was more after a kind of moving towards or away, stretching off into the distance kind of look. But the effect is still pretty cool, and the sky almost looks spherical in nature, as though you can see the earth turning. One thing to be mindful of when taking a photo like this is things moving in the background like foliage. It can give the appearance of a soft image due to motion blur. It's best to focus on something solid and static in the foreground and push any moving elements into the background. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with that and I'm looking forward to the 9 or 10 likes that it'll get on Instagram. I mean, it's not a selfie and there's no girls in it, so... Maybe next time I should make a video on how to take the perfect selfie in the comfort and warmth of your home. We'll get a million views in the first day. Well, I hope that you liked this video and that you found it informative. These are trying times for people in the creative industry, so I'm going to ask you all to like and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. I'll put the link below, and also if you liked this, uh, there'll be more content like it, so please subscribe. It's free, and ultimately if I make even one video that helped you out in some way, then it'll have been worth it. And like I keep saying over and over again, if you know someone in the creative industry who's struggling during this time, just like and share their stuff. It'll help them out a lot later. Accept my nemesis. Do not like, do not follow, do not share. I suppose you need to know their Instagram so you know who not to follow. Okay, but keep it to yourself. Their username is at... Guys, do you know how much of a ball ache this was to set up? Just please follow me on Insta and Facebook. Just that's all I ask. I also wanted to give a shout out to at Illustrated Life for doing this nice little illustration of me. That is profile pink material right there. Give her a follow as well. Should I green screen something behind me? What do you reckon? Like a sunny beach? Maybe a volcano?